about a punch in the gut. They had briars on their pants. Twin crosses now mark the spot. Someone wanted them silenced. I don't see how, how people could do this and have a conscience and go to sleep at night. A black man had sex with a white girl. Where was the evidence? July 31st, 1999, the South reeling from a mass shooting in Atlanta that killed or wounded 21. But Georgia seemed so far away from Southeast Alabama. Little did we know that another violent crime would take place here that weekend. The murder of high school students J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett for no apparent reason. Crimes that still haunt us today. In Alabama, the dog days of summer are almost too much to bear. Absolutely brutal. And in 1999, stifling, unforgiving temperatures grip tighter than usual. I think that day the temperature was 101, 102. That day was July 31st. So 17-year-old Tracy Jean Hollett was a second year majorette and she wanted to be a doctor and a missionary. Tracy was thankful for her summer job in air conditioning. J.B. Hilton Green Beasley was an aspiring and talented dancer for much of her life, more than half of it, and she received several trophies and awards. The classmates were inseparable. For J.B., Tracy was someone she could depend on, her best friend. We're just aiming for their senior year at high school, and on July 31st, 1999, JB was actually celebrating her 17th birthday. It was a day the girls wanted to be memorable. Then there was something else. Classes would be starting in barely more than a week, bringing the fun of summer to a close. Eager for celebration, JB went to a popular store a little before nine on that steamy Saturday night to wait for Tracy. She was just finishing up her work shift in the men's department at JCPenney, and they basically followed each other back to Tracy's home. It was nearly 10 by the time they freshened up. With a few hours before Tracy's curfew kicked in, the teen set out to enjoy a midsummer night, one that would turn into a nightmare. Now, 99% of the time, Kids stayed out too late, eventually comes home. They didn't come home, and that was not their character. Back in 1999, now attorney John White was the Dothan police chief. He knew Tracy through her father. The men worked together on the force. After Tracy's father passed, White stayed in touch with her mother, Carol Roberts. On the night in question, White was also the one Carol called on when she discovered Tracy and JB weren't home. Tracy Hollett's mother called me, and she said, I'm a little concerned. Uh, Tracy and her friend didn't come home last night. White tries to reassure her and offers help. She gives me a description of the car. JB's 1993 Black Mazda 929, the same car connected to a crime that's rocked South Alabama for nearly three decades. There's kind of a very simple version of this story that's told, which is, uh, the two teenage girls are trying to get to a party. They get lost. John Lorden is an online sleuth. His podcasts have attracted millions. Perhaps only the police have spent more hours investigating this case. We are three um, true crimers. Lorden spent months tracking down tips and looking for answers about what happened to two young girls that horrific night. They might have been interacting with more people that night intentionally or there's also the possibility that they were interacting with people that they didn't want to interact with. What Lorden and investigators agree on, JB and Tracy drove out of Dothan, likely passing Northview High School where they attended classes. They believe the girls may have been searching for a field party and stopped to get directions. 
Tips police investigated claim the girls used a payphone a few miles up the road in Headland. Some leads investigators pursued claimed that was the first of a few stops. What we know for sure, JB and Tracy made it to Ozark around 11.30 that night. In the early morning hours, Tracy's mom awakens to find her daughter never made it home. She frantically calls White and the search for the girls is on. It wasn't long before officers 20 miles from Dothan found Tracy's car. We notified the Dothan Police Department and uh, an investigator came to Ozark and uh, they began to look at the car. Tracy's car was discovered along a narrow, rarely traveled road, barely a mile from Ozark Square, the city center of this gateway to Fort Rucker. At first, officers believed the girls may have just parked on this vacant lot and gone somewhere else. They looked around the area and waited, hoping the girls would make their way back when the Dothan Police Chief John White arrived. He asked a question that would change their search for missing teens to one for a murderer. And I just made the statement, you know, have you looked in the trunk? Uh, well, they hadn't because they didn't have a car key. And I said, no, this is the Mazda 929. I said, there should be a trunk release up there somewhere. Ozark patrolman pops the trunk, and there they are in the trunk. The two young girls laid together, dead from what appeared to be gunshot wounds. It would eventually be confirmed they were shot with a 9mm pistol. By the time officers found their bodies, they had been dead for a while. It was basically about 14 hours that, um, that we're looking at. And as my understanding uh, from being in the trunk and the heat, of course, that expedites decomposition. Investigators lost one step because just like the day before, temperatures on Sunday, August 1st, also soared. We kept the girls where they were until we got it downtown to the morgue. So that we could work where it was air conditioned and, you know, the heat was just terrible. Police had a mystery on their hands. Two dead girls, a car parked along a lonely road, no car keys, and no murder weapon. Divers with the Houston County Sheriff's Department began searching for the 9mm pistol late Wednesday afternoon. To this day, that murder weapon is still missing. Other things also baffled investigators. Tracy and JV's jeans were covered in mud, but where did it come from? The evidence wasn't adding up. The car was clean. One theory was that the girls had the car washed when they got to Ozark. The police quickly ruled that out. On the side of town that they were at, here, there, there was no car wash. There was no car wash at the big little store. So that's just another mystery. The big little store. That's where Carol Roberts heard her daughter's voice for the last time. Tracy called just before midnight to tell her mother she and JB were lost. After getting directions, and with only one or two turns needed to get back to Dothan, Tracy assured Carol they would be home soon. And basically what we're doing right now is running down any, uh, any leads that we can develop. Despite the unanswered questions, police confidently believed they would quickly have the killer in custody. You know, you had uh, forensic evidence, you had some other things that I won't go into that you would identify a perpetrator quickly. That case was, all right, we're gonna hurry up. We've got forensic evidence and we're gonna put it in that unknown database and just see if we can get a hit. The department didn't get a single match, but one thing became clear. The condition of certain things there would indicate that that was not the scene of the crime. They had briars on their pants as well, so it seemed like they had run through a field. There were some scratches on them and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, much later, we hear about another location. Police now believe JB and Tracy didn't die along Herring Avenue, where their bodies were discovered. When they're 
car is found the next morning, it's basically facing kind of the wrong direction. It's facing back to where they would have come from at that gas station. Quickly, all that confidence police had in a swift arrest faded. These are arguably the most shocking murders ever in this area. Two teens with promising careers gone. And then an investigation pointing toward one man that only deepened the mystery. You've got to know this person. He is a very good man. He's got a two and a half year old son. He's not, He's not capable of doing this to no 17 year old girl. On the night of the murders, Ozark resident Johnny Barentine left home. He's going out to get milk for the kids. It takes him 90 minutes to come home. He comes home, he's upset. He stays up the whole night watching TV. A month into the investigation, Barentine told police he had information about what happened to Tracy and JB during interviews with detectives. More questions surfaced than answers. Once they had those six, I think it was six different versions of the story from Barentine. During one interview, Barentine claimed he witnessed the shootings. In another, he told investigators he gave the killer a ride. We were running down just, you know, leads that in hindsight, they were just, well, you know what, I should have just kicked that one to the curb. Despite the inconsistencies in Barentine's confessions and struggles for the department to find evidence to back up the claims, police arrested the 28-year-old. I think they were just trying to get to that conclusion as fast as possible so they can kind of let the public know, okay, this isn't a murderer that's walking our streets. We've got the person, they're locked up, someone's gonna pay for what happened to these girls. You know, he's lived in Ozark for almost all his life. They don't know nothing about this man. It's not right. The expected relief didn't come. Weeks later, prosecutors dropped all charges. You're talking about a punch in the gut. An unanswered question remains. If Barentine wasn't responsible, why would he confess? One possibility prosecutors considered was the mounting reward for information about the case. Somebody wants to bring us a dollar or thousand dollars or, or ten or whatever it might be. Nearly fifty thousand dollars, what would be worth ninety thousand dollars today, was offered up, all in hopes of finding answers, while the hope of justice that Barentine's arrest provided quickly faded. When prosecutors dismissed the charges against Johnny Barentine, rumors ran rampant, even in court. Seems everyone had an opinion on who killed JB and Tracy. There were so many people talking about stuff they didn't know anything about. It seemed everybody had an opinion. That's when the rumors just took off. I mean, it was just, you know, and you'd read something on there where somebody said, well, I know who did it. And they're convicted on Facebook or, you know, it was absolutely crazy. The way the girls died added more mystery. Investigators are confident they were shot in one place, then driven to Herring Avenue, where their bodies were discovered in the trunk of Tracy's car. There had to have been a situation where someone wanted them silenced. Why? And I think that's what leads to a lot of different kind of conspiracy theories and some of the stuff that we saw pop up on blogs and that independent investigators were doing looking into this. The officers implicated by the Henry County Report, a blog ran by a man named John Carroll, later sued, but not before he gained notoriety from the case. In many articles, John claimed police killed JB and Tracy, and the whistleblower was someone inside the department itself. Even repeating these kind of dramatic elements to you makes me cringe. Like this is something that would have been in a detective novel or, or something. This isn't the reality of these situations. But you know, they would add to that <laughs> rumor, your word, and say, well, that's why nobody's been arrested. They're protecting him. You know, they swept it up. I'm like, come on. 
The woman he says blew the whistle, Raina Crum, Ozark Auxiliary Officer back in 1999, would recant her story. And she effectively says, I lied. I lied about the whole thing. I lied. Uh, please forgive me. I don't know why she did it, but admittedly she did. The blog shut down. John Carroll filed bankruptcy, and the officers behind the lawsuit dropped the case. To this day, there has never been any evidence to support claims that they were in any way involved with the deaths and disappearances of J.B. and Tracy. One thing remained consistent. Every year, family and friends who loved and missed J.B. and Tracy gathered here on Herring Avenue in Ozark, where police, in 1999, found their bodies. Twin crosses now mark the spot beside Ozark's Herring Avenue where the bodies of the inseparable best friends were found in the trunk of their car. Prayers for closure were lifted. I don't see how, how people could do this and have a conscience and go to sleep at night. You know, I keep praying every day that the Lord will just make it impossible for them to sleep. Well, there's not a day that goes by that we don't do something on the case. The police never closed the case, but all leads hit dead ends and a cold case turned icy. Then when things really seemed to quieten down in 2019, something dramatic happened. Something really dramatic. Officers got a break they so desperately needed when improved DNA technology pointed to a new suspect, Coley McCraney. In March 2019, officers pulled McCraney's 18-wheeler over in Daleville. He was arrested and charged with capital murder and rape. Coley McCraney, a husband, father, truck driver, and part-time pastor, killed two girls in cold blood for no apparent reason? McCraney has no other criminal history. Police say absolutely he committed the crimes. But others say, just like Johnny William Barentine, investigators got this one all wrong. Before then, the worst crime McCraney had ever been accused of was driving a truck overloaded with cargo. But no, I mean, he doesn't have the backstory that you would expect. We don't see the kind of um, crimes that might be developing into this pattern, you know, previous sexual assaults, um, even pre previous domestic violence incidents. There's just, there's, there's none of it. Like, you just have to believe that this guy did that 24 years ago and just stopped. As for the DNA matched to evidence from the crime scene, McCraney's attorneys have their own explanation. So what is this case based on? Some DNA that a black man had sex with a white girl. That's really, at the end of the day, what we're, what we're talking about here. They claim McCraney had an intimate encounter with JB but few details were released. That's because, shortly after McCraney's arrest, a judge issued a gag order in the case, banning it from being talked about publicly. And it's, it's strange because one of the big things I have about this case in terms of trying to understand it is the lack of motive for really killing these girls. Something else nags at online investigator John Lorden. Then you have Coley get arrested and basically, you know, when he's being questioned by police, he's telling them, I don't know this girl. Well, that's pretty compelling because he has, he has to be lying. In some way, he has to know her or he interacted with her body. Claims verified by Lieutenant Michael Bryan, the chief investigator with the Ozark Police Department. He testified during a court hearing on April 3rd, 2019, that McCraney told him he did not know the girls. Former Chief White, believes the case has taken a toll on officers who suffered emotional trauma because of the murders. The only thing that puts a little salve and balm on your PTSD is this belief that one day this will be solved. And I think that's my biggest emotion, you know, is I've relaxed a little bit. Now is the time to try this case in a real courtroom. I think the prosecution is going to have to tell a very compelling story that is supported by information and facts and evidence. Paragon Nanolab 
is a DNA processing facility. A spokesperson for the company says DNA evidence is reliable, but speaking generally, and not about this case, admits evidence alone is not enough. But no one's going to be arrested based on what we say alone. Law enforcement has to take that tip and then go and build their traditional forensic case. The families are going to have to relive what happened 24 years ago in excruciating detail and kind of like slow motion with experts commenting on every piece and every aspect. This is going to be terrible on those families. Everyone that knows my man of God knows that this is only a test and this is just a challenge of our faith. My husband Coley once told me that the closer you are to God, the battles we will face will come, sometimes become unbearable. Where was the evidence? It wasn't there. Still not there. I think there's going to be a reaction, whichever way the gavel comes down, that is, is going to affect a lot of people in a really, really big way. And I don't know what comes of that. All I've ever wanted to do was stand in front of someone one day and ask them why why you thought you had the right to take my daughter's life. For more than four years, Coley McCraney has awaited trial. Finally, Judgment Day has arrived. Watch News Force coverage of the McCraney murder trial through the News 4 app.